The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. You have to look at South Africa as South Africa, but then you have to think about its economic security and political influence in the Southern African region first, but then again, sort of across the continent, and then again at the global level, because if you're gonna want an African perspective on a global challenge, right, whether that's internet privacy or climate change, or even thinking about strategic competition, the South African voice is gonna hold a lot of weight and it's going to be representative. Maybe not every country in Africa loves that, but it will represent many African views. I'm David Priest, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, July 16th, 2021. National security attention rarely focuses for long on sub-Saharan Africa, and when it does, it's largely on the most populous countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Former Intelligence Community and National Security Council official Judd Devermont, now director of the Africa Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, wants to change that. Along with Nicole Willett, who used to cover Africa for the State Department, the National Security Council, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Judd has created and co-hosts the new podcast called 49, now available everywhere. This podcast jumps headfirst into the past, present, and future of U.S. policy towards each of sub-Saharan Africa's 49 countries. I sat down in the virtual jungle studio with Judd to discuss a few of these countries, the new podcast, and the opportunities for the incoming Biden administration to make real inroads in relations with countries across the continent. It's the Lawfare Podcast, July 16th. Africa and U.S. foreign policy opportunities with Judd Devermont. Judd, let's start out with a look backward. Let's take a quick survey, if you will, of the last 20, 25 years of U.S. policy towards sub-Saharan Africa, specifically in terms of what initiatives have gone generally well and we can build on and which ones have not met their promise and probably need some more attention in the Biden administration. So, Hit us with the the greatest hits and the worst hits of the last quarter century. Thanks, Dave. What's remarkable about U.S. policy towards sub-Saharan Africa, particularly uh, since the uh, mid-90s, is continuity and bipartisanship. And each administration has come up with one or two signature programs. And then usually that is being embraced by their successor, improved upon, advanced. And so that's exactly what we've got. Uh, over the last 20-something years. Uh, The Clinton administration passed the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which allowed uh, unilateral trade preferences for African exports to the United States. That has been something that every administration has embraced and continued to build on. Uh, Then we move into the Bush administration, probably the most popular president in Africa, in part because of uh, his work on HIV AIDS, uh, the PEPFAR program, as well as the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Under President Obama, a couple of initiatives that stand out and have stood the test of time, uh, the Young African Leaders Initiative, also known as YALI, and then Power Africa. One event that he did that there's an expectation will be resumed is the uh, African Leaders Summit that was held in 2014. And then we get to President Trump. Let's count the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, as an important initiative that is broader than than Africa, but impacts Africa greatly, as well as Prosper Africa. And there, 
The story is a little mixed. Doing something that I think is important, which is improving coordination between U.S. agencies and departments, but a, a poor sort of messaging plan rollout, uh, and it, it's going to need some work by the Biden administration if it's going to fulfill its promise. Let me go go back a step here. You mentioned one initiative from, I think, almost 10 years ago now, which was Power Africa. And this one was interesting because as opposed to these broad brush approaches towards the continent, the U.S. government, if I recall correctly, was able to generate new interest by focusing primarily on one sector and making a successful initiative out of it. Talk a little bit about Power Africa, what it did and could that be a model for working between uh, Africa and U.S. companies? I think it absolutely is a model. Um, and it's a pretty brilliant idea, which is that here's a key need uh, for many countries, which is electric power generation, and that there's a private sector answer to it. And so what the Obama administration did is create this mechanism for coordination, Power Africa, work closely with Congress to pass the Electrify Act, Electrify Africa Act. And they serve as a clearinghouse to help U.S. companies navigate this space, invest in these opportunities, which has both foreign policy goals for the United States, development goals for the United States, but obviously core to strengthening African economies. And, and what people don't realize about it, Dave, this is my favorite part, I was invited to a Power Africa meeting uh, when I was at the White House, when I was the director for Nigeria. And you know, I could talk forever about Nigeria. I'm never, I've never lost for words. And I got into this Power Africa Nigeria meeting and they were talking, you know, 15, 16 agencies with such granularity and specificity about discos and, and power ministries. I had nothing to contribute. And the reason I tell you that story, why it's important is that we created experts inside of our government to talk to both their African counterparts as well as to the private sector in a way that just sort of your jack of all trades commercial officer can't. And for me, that is the model that has to be replicated for Prosper Africa. Prosper Africa right now is this one-stop shop. Uh, anyone should come and, and the U.S. government would help them, but they've been reluctant to say, here are the sectors like power that we think are advantageous for the private sector and have a connection to our national security interests. And we can build experts to help you in a way that if we present ourselves as just everything to everyone, we're really not going to give you that sort of concierge service that you need. Right, right. Well, I want to come back later to how how that could play out tactically in terms of which which sectors are most promising. But first, building on that, that overview of some of these big initiatives across all of sub-Saharan Africa, let's get more specific here. Until the Biden administration came in, you also had some policies directed at specific countries, of course, in sub-Saharan Africa, whether it was Nigeria or some of the countries in the Sahel or in the Horn, of course, South Africa itself. But a lot of these issues in the history of U.S.-African relations are driven by crises, whether it's a political crisis, a humanitarian crisis, or, or something even worse. What are the things that someone who is coming into the Biden administration to work African issues should have learned from that past 20 years of responding to crises and how to better prevent them in order to have a better policy starting out towards the continent as a whole? I think that's a, it's a great question. One of the challenges is that we we triage when it comes to responding to the crisis du jour. And obviously, there's an expedience there. It's a reflection of the lack of resources. But what that means is that we are robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, we are hesitant and reluctant and unable to really focus on prevention because we're we're responding to the shiny object. You know, let me give you an example on Nigeria again, and I apologize to your listeners. There's always a lots of Nigeria uh, when I'm example. on this show. But when you think about Nigeria, when Boko Haram came out in 2000, really made, made headway uh, in 2009, the U.S. government pivoted almost exclusively to deal with that security challenge. 
Uh, and so some of the peace building efforts that they were doing in the Middle Belt, where there is a mix of Muslim and Christian populations, different ethnic minorities, the work that they had been doing in the Niger Delta, the oil rich Niger Delta, and addressing militancy, all of that disappeared. And so what happened was, well, those issues flared up again at some point, whether it's in the Middle Belt, you know, a couple of years ago, and just recently, even with the Niger Delta militants threatening again, oil facilities. And we had lost so much of our institutional knowledge, our resources had been reassigned. And we are now starting from scratch in some respects to respond to that and think through these problems. So I think the key here is that you've You've got to have enough muscle memory on the various issues to respond early and often. That's a huge ask for the U.S. government and particularly for the Africa Bureau at State or, or at USAID and other counterparts. And so this is where the partnerships are really important. Mm -hmm. It's a core way that we deal with problems globally. But I, I do think that in Africa, it's still not as developed as it should be. It's still thought of as let's work with the French on French, former French colonies and the Brits mm -hmm. on former British colonies, not thinking about the fact uh, that, uh, you know, India for example, has trained many Nigerian military officers. They go to their staff and command college, not thinking about the growing philanthropic class in Nigeria and how they could be helping, or I would say across Africa, giving short shrift at times to civil society and the media. So we have to have a global view of the problems in Africa, meaning partners that are outside of Africa. And we have to have a continental view in terms of keeping track and building partnerships, even if they're sort of, you know, on the bench and just warming uh, so that we can respond in the early phases of the conflict uh, or the instability, as opposed to when it's gotten, you know, out of hand and now we're in a much more intractable situation. Right. And how has the development and institutionalization of the African command, AFRICOM, helped overall diplomatic efforts in that regard and U.S. government preparation? And, and how much has it, in fact, delayed it because of some of the difficulties getting it started? Well, the difficulties getting it started had a lot to do with messaging. And, and maybe we can come back to this. Uh, mostly AFRICOM was cooked up inside to the U.S. government. Uh, and so when it was announced, many of the African governments blanched. It had a ring of of neocolonialism to it. Not that that's my view, but that's how it was perceived. Um, and so it took a lot of time for AFRICOM to win back the trust and good graces of many African leaders and publics. Uh, but now in 2021, I can tell you that AFRICOM is probably the part of the U.S. government that an African leader is going to engage with more than anyone else right. outside of the ambassador. Right. And I wrote a, an article uh, for Lawfare about this. They are doing a lot of diplomacy. They often attend presidential delegations at inaugurations. They're doing a tremendous amount on the COVID-19 response. In fact, I think AFRICOM is the most visually dynamic partner. They're the ones that are delivering PPEs or ventilators. Uh, they're the ones that are building field hospitals. And they do things behind the scenes that are important as well, such as rule of law training. The rest of the U.S. government, and I think AFRICOM as well, realizes that we don't want to present our policy as being overly militarized. But um, AFRICOM is, I think, more than just kinetic counterterrorism. And the more that we embrace mm -hmm. that, I think the more that we can leverage it in a smarter way. Okay. So that points to the need for an incoming administration, let's say the Biden administration in the last few months, to have a, a better, perhaps more nuanced sense of the relationships, because you may have an overall US policy towards sub-Saharan Africa, but you're not dealing with something called sub-Saharan Africa. You're dealing with the government of Zambia or the foreign minister of Ghana. You're dealing with actual people in actual countries. And you recently have identified a, a real gap here that even among Africa watchers, there's not necessarily the level of understanding that we would want for policymakers coming in on where the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and individual African countries has been and what the opportunities are for the future. So talk a little bit about this thing you've created to try to help with that, the podcast called 49. Thanks, Dave. We are really excited about this new podcast. My friend and colleague, Nicole Willette, uh, who is the chief of staff at the Open Society Foundations, 
and had worked with me at the National Security Council, at State Department, had worked in Congress uh, on African issues at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, she and I decided to do this very ambitious, kind of crazy podcast where we are going to help our listeners think through the past, present, and future of U.S. policy towards each country in sub-Saharan Africa, all 49 of them. So obviously, uh, that's why we're calling it 49. And maybe just one minute on why we decided to do this. Absolutely. I have another podcast called Into Africa at CSIS, and we've been running it now for three seasons. And what I found... Uh, in terms of feedback, is that if a new diplomat was assigned to a new post or or someone was going to be at AFRICOM, or even there was going to be a student who who's taking their first Africa class, their professors, their colleagues, their peers, their bosses were assigning Into Africa as a way to get smart. Now, Into Africa is a reaction to news events and maybe a, a deep dive on a, a big theme, but it's not you know, what is the story of U.S. policy towards Chad or Uganda uh, or Ghana? And so what Nicole and I decided to do is to create what is essentially an off-the-shelf podcast so that you can get smart on whatever country that you are working on. Two other things that are important here. First, Nicole and I have a lot of experience in policy. So not only can we deliver the history and the big ideas, but how to actually get it through the interagency. And that's the focus of the podcast is thinking right. about the different tools, challenges of making policy in the U.S. government. And then lastly, the time couldn't be better. Uh, the Biden administration is filling most of their seats now. Uh, for the Africa positions. And so they're going to start thinking about what their strategy is. And we hope this will be a contribution to that process. That sounds great. And I can imagine if I were anyone from a, a desk officer at the State Department to an assistant secretary at defense or somewhere else with African responsibilities, uh, I would definitely want to get this kind of overview. But of course, you face a problem here, right? Which is the absolute crazy diversity between the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So on the one hand, you have a country like Nigeria, which sadly we're not going to focus on a lot in this conversation for your purposes, but a country that has relatively more experience in the US government dealing with and more issues that come to the plate. Even a country like Ethiopia, uh, not just because of the current crisis, but historically. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got countries where Filling 15 minutes in an episode almost seems like a challenge for anyone except for the most ardent watcher of that country. Some of the small island nations or some of the landlocked countries in Africa that frankly have received relatively little bilateral attention from the US. So let's talk through some of those. I've had the opportunity to listen to several episodes of the podcast. And one that struck me first was Malawi, a country that gets almost no attention outside and perhaps even inside interagency meetings on sub-Saharan Africa. Why is Malawi interesting to the U.S.? Particularly, if I recall, Secretary of State Clinton did visit there. What drove her to do so? And, and what does that present as an opportunity for the Biden administration to build on? Malawi is a, is a great example and, and one of uh, my favorite episodes so far. So we interviewed, and I should say in each episode, we interview a former U.S. diplomat, an African journalist or academic or activist. And so in the Malawi case, we talked to Ambassador Johnny Carson, who is really the dean mm -hmm. of Af U.S. policymakers on Africa. He served as the ambassador to Zimbabwe, Uganda, to Kenya, and then he was Assistant Secretary of State uh, under President Obama. And, you know, Malawi is really interesting for a couple of reasons. First, as you go through its history, you realize that it tried to balance uh, between working closely with the West and in some cases, working with them on issues that were not very popular in Africa, particularly around uh, South Africa, uh, the U.S. government, for your listeners, was on the wrong side of history here uh, by not forcefully attacking or opposing apartheid until sort of really the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but Malawi had a similar challenge in that uh, it depended on South Africa for its economic wealth. So you learn a lot about how Malawi sort of navigated that challenge. That's one. 
But then you get these moments where you can see how the U.S. plays a critical role in this in a juncture, a political juncture that was going to determine Malawi's overall trajectory. So in the case of Malawi, the president, Bingu Mutharika, passed away. Uh, many people around him did not want to see his vice president, Joyce Banda, become uh, the new leader. And the U.S. Uh, worked very diligently with civil society, with uh, the Malawi military, other political stakeholders to make sure that transition went through. And it's been a couple of other sort of twists and turns in Malawi's history, but the courts ultimately just recently annulled a fraudulent election, and there was a new president who was elected. His name is Lazarus Chakwera. And because of those incidences, the economists held up Malawi as their country of the year in 2020 wow. for that democratic resilience. So, you know, you can learn a lot about how countries, individual countries navigate challenges that we can see echoes today, uh, but also the way that rule, the role that the U.S. can play in really making a difference uh, for a country's democratic and governance trajectory. And there aren't too many countries in sub-Saharan Africa with women leaders, are there? No, uh, it's uh, few and far between. Uh, right now, we have one female head of state, or I would say executive head of state. That is uh, Samia Sulu Hassan. She is the president of Tanzania. There is also a female president in Ethiopia, but it's uh, a figurehead position. It's not the executive role. Right. So Malawi, with, with its history, has a, a little bit of a special place among many of these countries. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's turn to a different country that you focus on in one of your episodes. Let me ask you about Namibia, because Namibia is a country that perhaps sadly got more attention in the last four years because of the former president's mispronunciation of it as Nambia than for almost any other reason. And to be fair, over the last several decades has received much more attention simply because of its past very painful relationship with South Africa and its extrication from the relationship with South Africa than for any inherent reason of its own. But you make the case in the episode that Namibia has a fascinating potential role to play in the Biden administration to be, in a sense, a, a lab for African initiatives, to be a place to try some programs out in a, a willing and able participant in a bilateral relationship. So Talk through just a little bit about why Namibia could actually be really well placed to give us lessons for wider initiatives across the continent. Yeah, I feel really strongly that, you know, the way that they assign ambassadors to embassies is your most senior ambassadors go to Nigeria, Ethiopia, South Africa, Kenya, if they're not political positions, and your more junior officers go to countries like Namibia or, or Botswana. And those ambassadors sort of do great work, but it's sort of uh, less visible to Washington for all the reasons that you mentioned, David. But, you know, what I wanted to do and suggested here is flipping the script, because these could be, you know, as you said, laboratories of innovation, opportunities to sort of see how we can shape a bilateral relationship in a way that is, is more catalytic, more transformative, and then scale. So then with that proof of concept to take it to other places. And Namibia being a strong democracy, independent in 1990, by the way, a huge role for the US in terms of working to ensure that the South Africans finally left Namibia, which they had treated as essentially an extension of their country in return for the Cubans leaving Angola. So just another example of the key role of the US. But Namibia uh, has had succession of power. They've had several different leaders. It's a democracy. And so I think there's some great opportunities here to try some new things. And by the way, the US, and this is mentioned in the episode, it's not that the US isn't afraid to talk about things that aren't going well in Namibia, which is something that sometimes we're reluctant to do. But there was a, a, a scandal around corruption in the fishing sector, the, the Namibians hmm. called fish rot. And uh, we imposed <laughs> sanctions on several ministers who had been involved in that. So Here's another, I think, big theme from the piece. So one may be like, how do we sort of think about countries as laboratories? The other one is we can walk and chew gum at the same time. 
we can talk about how do we build stronger relationships? How do we elevate, you know, really sort of outstanding achievements, but also be critical when we need to be critical and to use our tools to, to amplify that. That is great. Did you know this podcast is powered by ACAST? ACAST is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know ACAST. It's time you did too. Visit ACAST.com to find out more. ACAST for the stories. Let's turn to the big boy on the block in the southern part of the continent, which is, of course, South Africa. In your episode on South Africa, you address both some of the longstanding issues that have continued to linger from the United States constructive engagement policy into the 1980s, but then some of the more recent crises that involves particular leaders. And I'm wondering if you can contextualize for us where South Africa is and just how much of a priority the Biden administration policy-wise should be putting on the new leadership in South Africa versus building in civil society or trying to tackle both? You know, South Africa is an extraordinarily important country in sub-Saharan Africa and in the world, right? It's a member of the G20. It's an important voice in the G77. It's the second largest economy. Uh, It's often on the UN Security Council. It's often having key positions within the African Union. And the relationship, as we described it, and we talked to um, Ambassador Michelle Gavin, who had been President uh, Obama's first uh, senior director at the White House, the relationship is often what we say is cordial, but not close. And there's a lot of prickliness uh, about that relationship. So I'm going to make one point at the top, and then I can talk about the current leaders. The point that I'm just adamant about is that you don't get to pick and choose which countries you like uh, and you are going to deal with just because they're prickly. And I feel like for, for the last couple of administrations, because South Africa is difficult, it has a very strong view of itself and it um, you know, isn't a big fan of whoever's the hegemonic power globally, that we've kind of thrown our hands up with them. And that's not a luxury that we have in India right? That's not a luxury that we allow ourselves in other major countries. So the first is that, you know, we've got to deal with South Africa. This is a consequential country, period. But the interesting thing is that we have a moment of an opportunity here. South Africa's last president, Jacob Zuma, was very corrupt. He's actually now just going to jail essentially for contempt because he wouldn't appear at his trials around these corruptions. And his successor, Cyril Ramaphosa, I think is one of our our best openings for a strong and more vibrant and more productive relationship. Cyril Ramaphosa is kind of the best of all worlds, Uh, you know, career ANC guy, uh, the ruling party, and he was in the labor movements early in his career. He helped negotiate the end of apartheid, and then he went into business. So he sort of represents all of the different sort of facets of a very complicated party, which is the ANC. Mm -hmm. He has been a vocal actor when it comes to COVID-19 and dealing with the the crisis, both in terms of his own country, but making sure that uh, other countries uh, have debt relief or that they get their fair share of vaccines. So, uh, you know, he's incredibly important for the U.S. And I'm I'm hopeful that the Biden administration will take him seriously uh, in a way that I think previous administrations just found South Africans to be too frustrating. We couldn't have had, I think, a better partner in Cyril Ramaphosa. But even when things are going to get a little sticky, and they will, that's what happens, that we need to sort of persevere. Good news is President Biden has talked to uh, Ramaphosa once on the phone in between his election and inauguration, President Biden's election nomination inauguration. And then he had a pull aside with him Mm -hmm. recently at the G7. And that's, you know, there are a few African leaders so far that have gotten that kind of attention from the White House. I know that you're trying to to focus on the bilateral relationships between the U.S. and each individual country. But I have to ask, when it comes to some of the countries down in the southern part of the continent, whether it is Namibia or Malawi, but even Eswatini, Lesotho, Botswana, Zimbabwe, how much do the policies of the United States toward these countries 
really rely on how South Africa itself is evolving and relating to the U.S.? I think they they absolutely do. First of all, let's talk about uh, economic investment. Most U.S. companies in the ranges anywhere from 600 to 800 are based in South Africa, but have a regional mm-hmm. view. So that's their okay. headquarters in South Africa and their launching pad to engage with the other countries that we just mentioned. Uh, we look towards South Africa as the most important country in the regional body known as SADC, the Southern African Development Community, to shape responses to whatever the crisis du jour is. South Africa is right now playing a really critical role in the SADC response to the insurgency in northern Mozambique. South Africa you know, dominates uh, many of their neighbors' economies. Some of their currencies are tied to the RAND, which is South Africa's main currency, or they uh, depend on the technical know-how of South African nationals. So you have to look at South Africa as South Africa, but then you have to think about its economic security and political influence in the Southern African region first, but then again, sort of across the continent, and then again at the global level. Because if you're going to want an African perspective on a global challenge, Mm -hmm. right, whether that's internet privacy or climate change, or even thinking about strategic competition, the South African voice is going to hold a lot of weight and it's going to be representative. Maybe not every country in Africa loves that, but it will represent many African views. Mm -hmm. We've discussed before, and certainly nothing in recent months has changed this, perhaps it's even accelerated it, that one of the primary prisms through which U.S. policymakers see sub-Saharan Africa and the countries within it is the prism of great power competition with Russia and in particular with China. One of the fascinating episodes of 49 that I listened to was the one on Angola, because one of the points that you in conversation with, with Nicole and your guest make is that Angola could actually play a really interesting role here because the Chinese influence in particular uh, Russian as well, they do manifest themselves differently in, in each country. But in the Angolan case, you've got some inroads there that could provide the U.S. an actual opportunity to use Angola almost as a go-between with Russia and China concerning issues re- related to potential conflict and at least tension in the continent. Talk through that a little bit. What could Angola serve in this regard? And is that a model for anyone else in Africa? Yeah, really interesting parallels here to both Namibia and to South Africa. But here's a country where we were on the wrong side of history again, supporting the rebel group UNITA, uh, whereas the current government, the MPLA, uh, had the backing of Cuba and Russia. It took us a very long time until the end of the Cold War to have a strong relationship. In fact, we didn't even have an embassy in Angola until the 90s. Wow. And the relationship with the, the, the longtime leader, Uh, He had been in power since 1979, was, again, maybe not even cordial, just cold. But the new president, uh, Jao Lorenzo, came to power in 2017, kind of surprised everyone by uh, throwing uh, many of the Dos Santos family into jail for corruption and saying very affirmatively that he wants a strong relationship uh, with the United States. And so far, uh, he's doing many of the things that we would want to see in Angola in terms of anti-corruption, at least pledges of of diversifying the economy, being a little stronger on on foreign policy, engaging uh, where his predecessor hadn't. And so the thing that that I think is really interesting about Angola is that because of its history with the Russians, with the Cubans, and China is a huge trading partner for them particularly in terms of their oil sector, is that when things get heated, what is the opportunity for a country like Angola uh, to serve as an interlocutor, uh, you know, a, a safe space? I guess it's one of my big things about Africa policy, Dave, is that Africa policy seems to be just for Africa policymakers, right? And I, that's, again, something that I think is unique and unfair, exceptional and counterproductive. How do we integrate uh, the foreign policy towards sub-Saharan Africa in a global perspective. And when we're talking about great power competition, it shouldn't be just about constraining China's maligned influence on the continent. It should be thinking about how African countries 
can help us uh, lower the temperature and address some of these challenges. Uh, one of the things that I would like to see African governments do, and maybe this won't be Angola, maybe this will be a country like Ghana, for example, or Kenya, is not just say we don't want to choose, but to say affirmatively, these are the things that we expect from our foreign partners, China or otherwise, and create a set of standards around transparency, environmental protection, and trade and investment lending, then, then we can go and say, we're going to abide by them, Beijing, your move. And so this is the kind of ways that I think that African countries can play a critical role in great power competition and actually help shape the battle space, so to speak. Building on that, which countries in Africa do you think are, to put it bluntly, underperforming internationally? And by that, I mean, which countries do you think with the right motivation and the right encouragement from the Biden administration could be playing a more productive role in international organizations with peacekeeping missions, with global economic institutions, and in a sense, starting to punch at their weight outside of the continent itself? Yeah, great question. Let me talk about a little bit about uh, who is already punching above their weight, or maybe just share with your, your listeners how many Africans are now in key positions in global institutions? You may know that the head of the WHO is Dr. Tedros, an Ethiopian. You may be aware that the head of the WTO is uh, Dr. Ngozi nkonjo Wella, who is a former Nigerian finance minister. The deputy of the UN uh, is a Nigerian, Amina Mohammed. So you've got a number of Africans now in really critical positions helping to set the, the rules of the road, uh, which is important. But I, I think that there's a couple of places where we could see more of that. Um, I think, for example, Ghana um, and their finance minister, Kenafori Atza, has been very clear about what the international financial system should look like. And I think that that should be encouraged. I think we have a potential here to see Africans lead on climate change. Uh, five African leaders were invited to the Climate Summit by President Biden. And some of them are really trying to make their bones on this issue. And that makes a lot of sense. Africans contribute sort of less than anyone else to you know, carbon emissions, and yet they suffer it disproportionately. So countries like Kenya is starting to talk about the blue economy. It could do more. Mm -hmm. A number of countries in Central Africa, from Gabon to, to DRC, are talking about how do they do conservation better in terms of carbon swaps. So those are a couple of places, I think, on the economic, on climate change, we could see greater leadership. And then on peacekeeping, it's really interesting. We have, I think, we're overinvested in a couple of countries uh, when it comes to peacekeeping. Ethiopia, and given its war, right. uh, the civil war there and the human rights abuses. I don't know how much longer we can depend on them. Uganda, which is also having lots of you know challenges and human rights abuses and anti-democratic, and maybe we shouldn't depend on them. And so where do we look to find new partners? Nigeria had always been a mainstay, but they're dealing with their own insecurity. So a couple of places that I think are really ripe for developing partners, they aren't going to give you the 4,000 troops that Ethiopia does or, or, or Nigeria can, but have a record of contributing in very powerful ways, or at least the potential to. So uh, one of them is Angola. And I alluded to, uh, they're starting to do a little of this, like they did it in Lesotho. There's a new opportunity with Botswana, the current president, uh, Masisi. Uh, we should ask and see if he's willing to do peacekeeping. His predecessor, didn't uh, Sierra Leone, who benefited from peacekeeping when it had its own civil war in the 90s, right. is eager to do more. So there's a lot of places where, again, it's coalitions of the willing. But, you know, I guess 49 is really about understanding what each country's unique assets are, whether it's security or economic or foreign relations. And then how do we create an inventory Mm -hmm. uh, of those skills and then use them more wisely, do the care and feeding that we need, give the attention that they deserve, and then you know strike with a policy that is going to be uh, more forward-leaning and more rewarding and more mutually beneficial. Both you, Judd, and your 49 podcast co-creator and co-host, Nicole, have, have worked in the U.S. government and had a lot of experience with the National Security Council process, the interagency policy formulation and execution process. Frankly, 
how is that all to be coordinated effectively with with so many different bilateral relationships, uh, more than in any other defined region, the way that the U.S. government agencies tend to divide it up? How is it possible to effectively coordinate and build on the bilateral successes of these different bilateral relationships and get it to a successful, in a sense, almost interlocking policy or at least mutually supportive policy across all of these countries? Yeah, the interagency works like this. You tend to have IPCs, interagency policy committees, which is what Democrats call it. And it's called PCCs usually under Republican administrations. You know, they're usually based around countries. Nigeria, Ethiopia, maybe occasionally you have a cross-cutting issue or in the preparation for a strategy, you have an Africa or a sub-Saharan African IPC. But in general, they're really segmented by country. There's a lots of reasons that make sense. What I would argue uh, and what I'm not arguing for, uh, what I would argue for is that let's be clear about what our objectives are and what our expectations are for each of these individual teams of embassies and desk officers across the interagency. What are we asking them to do? What are we asking them to think about? So again, you know, I've talked about taking inventory a stock of their strengths or weaknesses, their foreign policy priorities and relationships, and then you know, asking how are you going to achieve those things in your country? And that's different than saying, there's four pillars of U.S. policy. It's democracy and development and trade and investment, you know, and security. I think we need to ask for different things and then asking embassies, how are you contributing to those? And then it's unleashing them, as I said earlier, to do the hard work to innovate and to report back. And that way, you know, you've got the big focus on the key pressing issues. You're working on those signature proposals, but you're 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 developing an arsenal of relationships that you know how to unlock when you need to. When you need a moderate, you need a someone who's going to serve as a mediator, you've been working on that in a in a country that you know seems to want to do more in that space. Or you have a country mm-hmm. that is really thinking about cybersecurity in a new way, and you're trying to develop that. So thinking about these relationships as advancing U.S. bilateral goals, but thinking about them being more than the sum of their parts. And that's, again, I think a place that we haven't been, is that we don't think about how policies and approaches in 49 countries aggregate up, not to just address the African challenges, but to really contribute to global solutions. Okay. Let's wrap up on perhaps the toughest question here is there's certainly limited attention from the senior most policymakers uh, for any particular region, but perhaps especially for for Africa. When we're talking about the president, the secretary of state and other senior officials who are not regionally focused, and if they choose to prioritize 49 different things in sub-Saharan Africa, that is effectively prioritizing none of them. So play that out and do the tough job for us of laying out what are the top priorities, whether individual bilateral relationships that should be nurtured because of the the effects that will come from that alone, or something that does cut across multiple countries that will pay the greatest dividends early in this administration. Where should they be prioritizing? Well, this is the big question, right? This is uh, always the challenge, uh, and especially the way that we frame this podcast on 49. But maybe I'll do it as part recommendations and, and part report card. Uh, so I do think the Biden administration has been right to put most of their energy and very senior attention on Ethiopia because the stakes are so high. The civil war in Ethiopia, the mass atrocities that we are seeing, the way it will affect uh, the larger region is critical. And I think that they're, they're absolutely right to be focused on Ethiopia. I think that, as it's probably not a surprise, focusing on Nigeria and you know rolling up your sleeves to say that we've got to have a strong relationship and, and a productive relationship and a transformative one with with Nigeria is important, not just because Nigeria is the largest country uh, in terms of population and economy, but because there are so many Nigerians and Nigerian diaspora here in the United States. So I think, you know, you've always got to focus on those countries as well as South Africa, which we've talked about. Uh, But then I would do a couple of things. I'd look for where are the countries where transformation is possible? Uh, 
where an extra, you know, effort by the U.S. can make a huge difference. And I think that has certainly been in the case uh, of Sudan. And I think there's a new opportunity in Tanzania, given the change in leadership. The previous president who uh, Samia uh, Sulu Hassan replaced, you know, was a COVID denier, essentially, you know, and pretty much an anti-truther. You know, that's an opportunity. And then I would say, Dave, is you think about, you know, big priorities in Africa, which is sort of, you know, dealing with the economy and thinking about the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which has real mm-hmm. potential to create one of the largest trading blocks in the world. How do we really support that? How do we think about, uh, as I said, climate change, uh, but then working to make sure that our engagement is not just about who's in the penalty box and who uh, is on a pedestal. That's been a recipe for failure every single time. We lift people up and then we regret that and we put people in the penalty box that we actually really do need for partners. So when I guess my advice would be deal with countries because we have business with them, that we have to get things done and we're not afraid to say when things are going wrong and we're delighted when we can say things are going right, at least consistent with shared interests. Um, and then think about where are our partners globally that could be helpful because Africa is part of the world and the world is part of Africa. By the way, that was what John F. Kennedy mm-hmm. said in 1961. And sometimes I think we still don't do that. So mm-hmm. those are a couple, I think, ways that we should be thinking about that. I mean, more from CSIS and me on it as we develop this podcast, because that's in part we're thinking out loud to kind of give those those sort of very tangible, concrete insights. But we do have to break some bad habits on U.S. policy. We obviously have to be very respectful of our president's time, but we could do a lot of this at different levels. We could be tapping into our civil society. We could be working with partners, not just in Europe. And you know, I think we can turn a corner to have a more affirmative and more productive and constructive relationship. That's a great place to close for today. Judd, thanks to you and Nicole for creating this new podcast, 49. And thank you for joining me today to talk about it. It's my pleasure. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please rate the podcast, share it widely on social media, and recommend it to one friend. And remember... You can get ad-free episodes of this Lawfare podcast by supporting Lawfare at patreon.com slash lawfare. This episode is edited and produced by Jen Pachihowell. Hamza Shatu is today's audio engineer, and Sophia Yan performed our music. As always, thanks for listening. Looking for a new podcast to listen to? Here's what we love, courtesy of ACAST Recommends. Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and along with Tracy Cox, who is an international sex expert and author of 17 books, I co-host the podcast Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy, and it's S-E-X-T-O-K. And the reason we have it as Sex Talk is because we happen to be viral TikTok (laughs) stars at the moment with some of our videos getting over 1.1 million views. So listen to us. I am totally shy and squeamish. She is super open, British, and hilarious. Listen to us each week as Tracy answers three anonymously sourced questions about all the things you talk to your girlfriends about. Listen on Acast or wherever you get your podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Acast. 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 Acast